So hi, everyone. Um, I don't know if you'll be watching this in the morning or the afternoon. So good morning, good afternoon. So what I'm going to be talking about today is how to examine images of adolescence in literary texts. And uh, this is about applying what is known as a youth lens, and I'll be explaining what that is in a while, to both Arabic and Western YA novels. So hopefully everybody will find a bit of something that's useful for them. I want to start with a confession that when I was preparing this presentation, I was sort of conflicted between doing two different things. So on the one hand, I wanted to talk about my work with Arabic YA, uh, but my concern was that some of the books that I've worked with are not translated into English, so I don't want that to be an alienating experience for some of you. On the other hand, I wanted to talk about how we can apply in general a youth lens, which is how to look at images of adolescence in a critical way, which can be applied to any novel, but then I was thinking, you know, okay, what's the point? What can I bring in? And how do I relate it to the, to the theme of the Summer Institute? So in the end, I kind of opted for doing both of them. Just a sec. So these are all the things we're going to be talking about today. It's quite a bit. So I'm gonna start with talking about my doctoral research because this whole presentation is based on that. And then I'm going to talk about what I mean by youth lens and why it matters, why it's an, I think it's an important skill for uh, teachers who are working with young people to, to try and uh, try out with their students. And then uh, this whole idea of a youth lens is based on um, a history of the ideas of adolescence. So I'll be doing a very short history uh, about adolescence and how the development of what we now consider young adult literature is very much related to the history of adolescence. And then, of course, I'm going to talk about Arabic YA, but also Western YA about Arab characters, whether they're set in the West or the Arab region, uh, but that were written to begin with in English, sometimes by Arab authors, sometimes by Western authors, but, you know, both of these things exist. And then this is, I guess, the main part of this presentation is how you can apply youth lens yourself in your classrooms to both uh, Arabic and Anglophone young adult literature. I personally applied it to Arabic literature, but I'm gonna just propose some very general things that can be very useful for you, I hope. And then coming to the very end, because I do hope that you will consider working with Arabic YA, whether it's in Arabic or translated into English, and some of the things to keep in mind, especially if you're working in the Western classroom, some things that it's good to try out with your students or sort of prepare for mentally. So I'm going to talk about my doctoral research very quickly. So this is the full title of my doctoral research, The Arabic Adolescent Novel, Tracing Constructions of Adolescence Within Texts and in the Discourses of Authors, Publishers, and Readers. Yes, it's a mouthful. If I ever convert this thesis into a book, I know I need to come up with a better title than that. But the reason I chose was because it gives you a good idea of what I did. So it was definitely about the Arabic adolescent novel, but it wasn't just about that because for me, a text does not emerge from a vacuum, from out of nowhere. There's an industry that produces these books and makes decisions about them. And on the other hand, you also have a whole cycle of gatekeepers. And last, but certainly not least, there's the young person who's, or the people who are targeted by these, uh, you know, by these books. And I wasn't able to focus on this entire system. So what I did focus on was authors, publishers, and young people. And my main angle, so the thing that sort of held my thesis together, was this question that I was asking. How are adolescents being represented? What are these books and these various people saying about young people? What young people need, what they want, and how they are. So these are my research questions. How are young people spoken of by authors and publishers? How are they imagined as characters in contemporary realistic Arabic adolescent novels? Because I did focus on those, uh, especially novels published since 2000. How are these ideas received by young people themselves? And this is how I went about answering these questions. So for the bit with the authors and publishers, I did interviews with five authors, five publishers. I analyzed and did a close reading of two selected texts. And actually the way these texts were selected was quite interesting. I started out with a list of 10 books. And then when I approached the, the school I was working with, they looked at the books, they put aside three ones that they didn't like because of their content or the use of colloquial Arabic. And out of the seven, I sort of distributed them to the students and they're the ones who chose these uh, novels. So they did, it was kind of a co-selection between me and them. 
And then in the end, I did research with the adoles with adolescent readers who would be 16 and above, sort of similar to sophomores in American high schools. This was at a Lebanese public secondary school in 2017 over, uh, I think, four or five months. This was a lot of fun. And we'll be seeing some of the things they said later on. So let's start with, earlier I spoke a bit about my approach and that's, like I said, it's what held the whole uh, pieces together. Uh, so it's looking at ideas, images, representations of adolescence and youth, not just find, trying to find out what they are, but looking at them critically. So this is, if you want, in social science, this is known as a constructionist approach. And these ideas are referred to as constructs of adolescence. That's one word you can use for that. And I think what's interesting is to why do we call it a constructionist approach? What's the construction that's being involved? And the idea there was that the ideas that we have in society about adolescence, that to a large extent, they're socially created. When it comes to age-related concepts, a lot of what we're used to thinking of is that it has to do with, it's a biological reality, or it has to do with how these people are naturally, but that's not the, that's not the story completely. And one evidence of that is that how our ideas about adolescence are, they change so much from one place to another, and from one time in history to, the, to another. And there's the idea of not only do they reflect reality to some extent, but not completely, but actually they can contribute to shaping reality for certain people. To give a very quick example, so now the way we think about what sort of life young people should have, we think that they should not be working, they should be in schools. So let's say because of that idea, you can have laws that require you know, young people not to be in school up to a certain age. And that's having a very concrete effect on their, uh, on their lives. This is quite simplistic because sort of um, the ideas and the implications of these ideas tend to work together. It's not easy to say one came before the other. But anyway, um, another name for this, uh, for this approach, it's a uh, youth lens. And the reason I use this, uh, this term in specific is because it was um, the ones who sort of came up with this, uh, with this term are educators. And they wrote an article that's included in the list of resources about how to apply this youth lens. Um, so you have the reference of the article there. It's by Petron, Sergianidis, and Lewis. And they define a youth lens as an approach to textual analysis that examines how ideas about adolescence and youth get formed, circulated, critiqued, and revised. So why should we go through all this trouble to apply this? And the reason for that is because we are surrounded by dominant ideas of adolescence. For the most part, we probably believe in them. But sometimes these ideas can be problematic. They can be harmful. They treat young people as one group. And they can also be disempowering. So now I have a list of some of these uh, stereotypical things we associate with adolescents. And if you look at them, most of them are quite you know, offensive. So young people are hormonal, apathetic, angsty, diffident, developing, risk-taking, emotional, moody, rebellious, insecure, impulsive, contradictory, de uh, defiant, self-absorbed, naively idealistic. So I'm sure a lot of these sound familiar to all of us. So imagine being on the receiving end, and this is what the main idea people have of you are, you know, are these ideas. So it's not really great. And there's something to keep in mind that the stereotypical teenage behavior, if it does exist in actual teenagers, is actually the privilege of, of a few because can you get away with acting like that? And some people can get away with it a bit more than others. So that's also something to keep in mind. And another thing you can notice that all these ideas are based, focus on one aspect of being a teenager, which is what's happening in terms of your physiological and psychological development. It's almost like we're looking at teenagers and all we're seeing are bodies. We're ignoring everything else. We're ignoring the fact that they are social beings, that they live in social contexts. We completely ignore that. So what I'm going to do now is I, I've referred several times to you know, dominant notions of adolescence. So I want to unpack these a bit. And a lot of our ideas of adolescence sort of emerged in the United States specifically and the West around the turn of the 20th century. And even though I was doing work in another part of the world, knowing the history of these ideas was really important. And I want to say that, I'm not saying these ideas never existed before because some of them did, but there was kind of like a grouping together of certain ideas that are part of this package. 
Um, so one of these phenomena was how these ideas about adolescence were considered universal. That was somehow new. Because if you think about different societies, they had all different ideas of adolescence. But what's been happening in the 20th century was this idea becoming more and more dominant and considered as sort of describing the experience of all adolescents everywhere. The idea of adolescence as a transition between childhood and adulthood, and anthropologists believe that all societies have an idea of this transition. But before industrialization, this transition was happening, or non-industrial societies, this transition was happening much quicker. Um, adolescence is connected to puberty, that puberty is the event that starts adolescence. And uh, the development of adolescence is according to these, um, if you want, the stages of physical and psychological changes. And these changes include, you know, at the level of the body, cognitive development, but also romantic and sexual initiation. And this word that we hear a lot, identity, identity formation. And that's from the work of um, Eric Erickson. In terms of uh, the conceptually how we think of adolescence, and here I'm quoting Lydia Kokola, who's a scholar of children's literature. She refers to it as a stress-filled buffer zone between childhood and adolescence. And one way of seeing that is in, note, in comparing how we think of children who are also non-adults and how we think of adolescents. So children are, you know, our ideas are very positive towards them. They're innocent, they're in need of protection. When, when it comes to adolescents, they're less innocent. We're also afraid for them, but also kind of afraid of them a bit. We find them as a bit of a disruptive energy. And that ambivalence is, uh, that's something I, you know, I think we need to be quite aware of and know how to deal with. In terms of we go beyond this time period and look at history over, you know, the history of humanity, Peter Stearns, he links shifts in ideas of childhood and adolescence to shifts in how in modes of economic production. So the movement from nomadic cultures to agricultural cultures and industrialization, especially in the West, even though the effect of industrialization wasn't immediate. It took over a hundred years uh, for to see concrete changes in terms of the lives of young people. And in terms of the everyday lives, one of the most important things or one of the most obvious things is that adolescents and children are supposed to be, for us, that's what we think they need to be in schools. They shouldn't be working. Um, that's why we have all these laws against you know, child labor and all that. But if we look at the course of history, the norm for adolescents and also a lot of children was to work. It was in the United States, for example, it was only in 1940 where the vast majority of teenagers were finally in public schools. And, and then it, that kind of became the norm in other Western countries. And uh, it also, I, I don't know if it's quite, it depends in different societies. Sometimes it's the norm. Sometimes you have still have a lot of, uh, you know, adolescents who are still working, it depends. And because young people came out of the workplace, they stopped being producers, they became consumers. And uh, there's another important word that I've been using interchangeably with adolescents, which is teenagers. And that word was first used in the 1940s. And the belief is the people who came up with this word were admin because they found like, uh, you know, young people had a lot of, of certain classes, of course, had a lot of disposable income. How do we get a piece of that pie? And this idea of their specific products that can be marketed to young people. And something else that's been happening, uh, I guess, the further that we've gone through the 20th century, especially after the 70s, um, is that adulthood is getting delayed. So adolescence has really been stretching a bit. Um, and another thing that accompanied the emergence of this new idea of adolescence was what the historian Joseph Katz refers to as um, institutions of custody. I think he was the first one to use that term, if I'm not mistaken. So schools, juvenile courts, youth clubs, and scouts. So if you actually look at the history of these various institutions, it would be interesting to match that with um, um, ideas of adolescence and how they developed. And another very important part of this package is that now we have special sciences that study adolescents. And the most, the one that probably first comes to your mind as I'm talking is developmental psychology. And that's also something that kind of started in the West, moved to other parts of the world. Um, I don't think it was always accommodated to the reality in different parts of the world. 
So that's another part of you know, the universalization of the experience of adolescence and kind of ignoring how it can mean different things for different people depending on you know, a number of things, whether you know, nationality, class, race, all these things. So now here I'm going to talk, okay, so what happened when this shifted from the West to other parts of the world? And here I'm gonna talk about both childhood and adolescence. So a modern model of childhood was developing in the West in the 18th and 19th century. And in the 20th century, what we had, maybe not the development, but a consolidation. But this sort of model of child of children as being relatively cherished, of getting more comfortable in terms of their lifestyles, again, not all children, certain privileged few, the conditions for this sort of uh, their welfare depended on things such as um, the transatlantic slave trade, European colonialism, and the world economy, which made life more difficult for children in other parts of the world. Um, and it actually, it sort of made the development of a, of a similar conception of childhood as having a nature of their own, as needing to be protected, as needing to be cherished. It made it happen later in other parts of the world. And speaking in specific of the colonial encounter, uh, this was kind of disruptive for local people because it did kind of count on in terms of the devaluing of local ways of doing things because there was a very clear power dynamic there and it included ways of child rearing. So that was disruptive in a way. Um, and also what was happening as society started to fight against colonial powers and as they started to, you know, the whole idea of society building in the independence eras, the child and young person was accorded a very important role to play in liberating the societies and building their nations. So there was a lot of talk about how do we rear children in a way so that they can contribute to our society in the best way possible. Uh, another thing that sort of contributed to the standardization of childhood and adolescence, even though we think of them as good things, you have international instruments such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which led to the universal idea of how children should be living, what their rights are. And again, there are some people who think that in addition to giving children more rights, in other ways it might have made uh, their, you know, their lives a bit more difficult. And I'm going to include a resource about that. And then after independence movements, now we have globalization and we have you know, even more cultural domination of the West. We have greater penetration of uh, you know, Western media. And that's also continuing to have uh, you know, an idea, like have an effect on uh, you know, how children are viewed and um, aspirations of what a good childhood is. And this is something that I think is specific to a lot of formerly colonized countries, which is, on the one hand, there's a recognition or a feeling or a belief that Western educational sciences are, you know, they're superior, that we need to sort of benefit from them. But on the other hand, there are fears about how local values can be affected. And there's this tension that started, um, you know, under colonial domination, but, it, but it's definitely been, you know, it definitely still exists. And here, and it definitely, even in YA, because YA is another form that sort of started in the West, came to the other parts of the world. And here I'm gonna quote from an interview I had with a Jordanian author, where we were talking about the stereotype of the angry teen. And this is, and she brought it up. So she was saying, so I am more or less offering an image that is not that of the angry teen. So I tell her, so you feel that the angry teen is a stereotype or does he, she exist in reality? The angry teen is a stereotype from the European, I think, and from the Western more because they have more, maybe the luxury to be an angry teen. And we have the angry teens here who are maybe more, I mean, from certain social class and they're angry at life for no reason at all or many other reasons. So the angry teen here will probably, will maybe be different from the one abroad. So you can see on the one hand and other parts of the interview, there's a lot that she admires about Western YA books, especially at the level of language and plotting. But there are things in terms of her own work, she's not very comfortable um, adopting. She doesn't think they apply. And she kind of, I mean, she does overgeneralize a bit, but the idea of certain teen behavior as kind of related to privilege, she does kind of have a point there. So I'm gonna talk a bit about Arabic children's literature and um, ideas of childhood and how related I think, or even if it was a bit 
came a bit after to colonial struggles, independence movements. So there was a strain of ide ideological children's literature and adolescent fiction that assigned young people a clear role in national struggles. And these books are, they have a very clear political framing to the point that maybe some people would find them a bit off-putting, but that's what it was. Even though since 2000, this has become much less the case where we're replacing them with more childlike images of you know, children are, you know, people of their own, they have their own worldview, they're not miniature adults, we cannot expect the same things of them as adults. So just to give these two examples, the one at the bottom is a book called Invait, the house. It was published in the 70s. And the main concept of it was uh, talking about different animals and how each animal has a house and naming the name of that house. So educational so far. And then it moves to talk about Palestinians and saying Palestinians don't have a house, you know, their home has to be has been occupied by their enemies. And to, to get their house back, they have to resort to military um, resistance. And this is, this is definitely quite controversial. And I think this can be a very good book to use to talk about our images of childhood. Is this acceptable? Isn't this acceptable? And the interesting thing is that the author, Zakaria Tamir and Mahdi uh, al Decades later, they were sort of, especially I think the illustrator, they were thinking, God, what were we thinking? You know, how could we write this book? Why are we putting so much on children? And I mean, we can agree or disagree with that, but it's definitely an important, um, it's a very important conversation piece, let's say that. And the one on the top, this is hopefully the series that I'll be examining in a future project. So this is a series called The 13 Devils. And The 13 Devils are 13 spies from 13 different Arab nations, and they are adolescents. The, they don't look it, but that's the author identifies them very clearly as adolescents, and they work together to fight the conspiracies that face the Arab nation. I mean, when you read the books, there's very, very little politics in them, because for the most part, it's just them having, you know, going on these different adventures, but the framing of that is very clear. And I think this book, the series wouldn't exist now, or it would only exist as a sort of carbon copy of earlier series because of these shifts in the ideas, for better or worse, that we've had in terms of how we look at children and adolescents. So coming back to the issue of YA in general, the reason we talk about it was because the emergence of YA was very much related to the emergence of you know, our modern conceptions of adolescence, even though there was a gap of a couple of decades. Uh, there's an interesting um, power dynamic in them because they're written by adults for the most part um, to be read by teenagers or young adults. And according to what some uh, people who study YA, um, one of the things they say that the reason it's good to look at these books critically in terms of constructions of adolescence is because they are not in fact about what it is to be an adolescent, but about what it might or should be. So there, you definitely get an adult trying to shape adolescence. And it's good to ask in what way are they being shaped? In fiction, representations of adolescence are images of what adults want teenagers to believe about themselves and their lives. Roberta Trice says, adolescent fiction acts as a tool of socialization. So once again, in what way are they being socialized? and adults wanting to instruct young people and guide them into adulthood. Um, and like, like we said, we have modern conception of adolescence starting in the West. We have developmental psychology starting in the West. How has the movement of why made it into the rest, well, in particular in my case in the Arab region? So I have a very, very quick overview here. Um, you're gonna hear a lot, including in some of the articles I'm going to include as resources, the belief that Arabic adolescent fiction is new, that is just emerging. That's not completely true because it has been around since around the turn of the century and it's taken a lot of different forms. Uh, so you have specialized magazines, short story co uh, collections, a lot of series, including the one I spoke about earlier, and also series that you might know from Netflix, which is paranormal, Mawara Tabia. And for those of you who haven't seen the series, you're looking at the poster and you're thinking, this is not a young person. You're not wrong. The main character is a middle-aged man who's a doctor. And which of course doesn't go with our, what we think of as the main protagonist in a YA novel. But also if you look at the history of YA all over the world, it was also relatively recent 
where the main character in the YA novel needs to be a young person. So that's quite an, uh, I think it's a way of, you know, trying not to say, you know, YA needs to look like this. But I have to say, and I think the reason people think of, you know, adolescent fiction as something new, because there's a new form of it that's been emerging since the start of the millennium. So we're getting fewer series, more standalone novels, different genres, but a lot of contemporary realistic. And you had a new generation of authors and publishers who emerged post 2000. Some of them started out doing picture books. They're still doing picture books, but they made the move into uh, writing for young adults. And the two books that I looked at in my research, that's the case of the two authors. And even though there is a corpus of Arabic adolescent fiction, it's not at all huge. So you'll be lucky if you get 100 books per year. And I think I'm just being extremely generous here. If you compare that to the numbers in the West, you know, there's a, there's a huge difference there, of course. Um, so what I'm showing here is basically all the Arabic adolescent novels translated into English. Uh, I'm including a list with all these titles. So all in all, there are seven titles and the one on the bottom right is, will be translated. Um, and in addition to the titles, I include like a brief synopsis of each title. So hopefully you'll find that useful. And then of course, you also have uh, books about Arab characters or set in Arab countries, but written in English. So these are just some, there are many more than these, of course. And I'll also be sharing links to web links to places that have, you know, uh, lists of these books. And uh, a lot of this literature will be concerned with especially with managing a dual cultural identity, especially people who are, you know, their parents are Arab, they're immigrants, they're growing up in the West and they're trying to sort of navigate this. Finally, we come to the two texts I did work with. Unfortunately, neither one of them has been uh, translated yet. Uh, the one with the white cover, it's called Cappuccino. I think that's self-explanatory. The one with the yellow cover, uh, it, the title translates into the mystery of the falcon's eye. And what I've done is I've applied a youth lens to these two books. And I want to sort of go through how I did that so that you'll be able to do something similar when you're looking at any, hopefully, any YA novel from anywhere in the world. So just to give you a very brief overview of the plot in terms of Cappuccino, it's told from two points of view, a boy and a girl, Anas is the boy. Lina is the girl. Each one has a family problem. In the case of Anas, his mother is um, a victim of domestic violence. In terms of Lina, her father died and due to how inheritance laws are set up, her uncle has complete control of the family fortune and he's using that to control them. Uh, with the other one, the mystery of the falcon's eye, uh, the main character Ziad is um, a refugee who lives in a refugee camp in the West Bank close to Kalandia, which is a checkpoint that controls movement into Jerusalem. And his family is going through, uh, his father has been detained, so he's left school to work. And his younger brother needs an operation, so he gets this crazy idea of trying to go back to the village from which his grand great grandparents were expelled when the state of Israel was started to try to reclaim his grandmother's trousseau and then sell the gold to be able to fund this uh, operation. So this is very quick, and then I'll be going back to some details of the plot. So the way I do this youth lens, I sort of organize it according to different uh, principles or questions. And then I try to propose concrete questions that can be asked to the students and sort of questions that guided me when I was analyzing the books. So the first thing is, and probably the most important, adolescence is not a universal experience. Even though we are so comfortable talking about teenagers are like this, young people are like that. No, they're not all the same. And I think we need to stop with this you know, verbal take. Um, and one way to do that is just look at this book. Which, what sort of adolescent experiences are being depicted in terms of gender, social class, nation, nation sexual, sexuality, ability, any other marker of identity that is relevant. So concrete questions that you can ask your students, and I've tried to sort of make these uh, questions sort of accessible to them. So what is the social background of the protagonist or main character? If you have several different main characters, you can do that, you can ask of each one. 
how do you think their experiences would have been different if they were of a different gender, social class, race, nationality, ability, gender, identity, religion? Uh, what is their lifestyle? Are they in school? Do they work? Do they have any responsibilities? Do they have, what freedoms do they have? What spaces do they move in? And you know, how do they get their, what sort of leisure activities do they engage in? And, and um, continuing with that, a question that can be answered um, is how do these differ based on the location of the novel and the time period? And here there's a sort of caveat, which is try to limit the discussion to the book. Try not to sort of generalize from the book to that particular context, even if it's your own context. And I think it works better if you compare books, that could be a bit more productive. Uh, historical novels are great because it shows you how 16 year olds uh, 100 years ago had very different life than today. You can also use oral history accounts and I'm gonna include some links to oral history, uh, like sort of databases, as well as testimonies of people growing up in different time periods. Um, Students can also be involved in doing sort of talking to their parents and grandparents. I think that could be, I mean, I'm somebody who really enjoys oral history, so they might enjoy that as well. And like I said, the important thing is that these comparisons should be made without judgment, that things are different. They're not, they're not always necessarily better or worse. And depending on where you are, you're gonna have a different idea of what's better or worse. So there's just something to keep in mind. And this is kind of how I applied it to my novel. So on the one hand, Cappuccino is set in Beirut, the two main characters, they're middle class. Uh, in addition to having a Lebanese passport, they have one has a German passport, another one has a French and an American one, um, which is gives them a lot of privileges. They're relatively, um, they're mobile, they're, they're not working, they're in school. Uh, they have access to the internet, each one you know, has their own device. Um, in terms of leisure, they spend a lot of time in cafes. I'm somebody who knows Beirut, that's, you know, there are lots of cafes, are places for people to hang out. She, the author is quite coy about mentioning religion. And this is where the place where the book is published could play a role because um, sectarianism is quite a sensitive issue in Lebanon. And I think that's why she avoided that. And then we come to the other book which is the mystery of the falcon eye. So Ziad, he's not at all privileged, he's a refugee. He had to leave school and work, something that he has mixed feelings about. Definitely less access to goods, like he doesn't even have access to the internet. At one point, his sister has to use the internet at, uh, at school. His freedom of movement because of the occupation is very restricted. And the fact that he's male actually makes it a bit more difficult for him to move because males would be considered a bit more um, dangerous, I guess, a bit more likely to be militants. There is some mention of religion, but you can see how religious, um, religion is kind of part of everyday life. There's not a lot of expression of beliefs, but for example, there's mention of um, like uh, the dawn prayer, things like that, which were kind of completely missing from the first novel. So here you can see two very different experiences of adolescence by comparing two different books. We now come to the other main question, which is what representations of adolescence emerge? How do these representations relate to images of adulthood? And the reason for that is because when we talk about adolescence, whether we, we're doing it directly or not, we are comparing them to adults. And to understand them, we have to look at ideas of adults and adolescence together um, uh, and compare them. So you can start by saying, what does this novel say about adolescence in general? Um, you can also link it to particular th things that the uh, protagonists have done or said. Um, the relationship between adults and young people in the novel, is it one of, uh, is one dominating the other? Do they cooperate? Is there conflict? Or um, do young people make decisions independently or are they constantly guided and controlled by adults? Are the adults themselves facing issues and sometimes similar issues? Um, these are also some other activities you can carry out maybe at the very beginning before you even look at the books, which is starting with the brainstorming exercise and you sort of you say words like teenagers. Um, what kind of ideas are you comes to your mind? What sort of ideas are you exposed to in the media? And how would you categorize these ideas? Are they positive, negative, neutral? 
how do you feel about having these ideas about young people? And what can be really illuminating if you do the same exercise for children and adult, are just to see how these, these three different age-related groups are viewed very differently. There's another great idea. This one isn't me, it's from Borsheim Black. And she starts by having, I think she works with uh, people who are trained to be teachers. And she starts by asking them to draw an image of, an, of a teenager. And then she analyzes these images, I mean, discuss it with them. So do these illustrations reveal certain stereotypes as, for example, young people as angsty, as you know, very much into technology? Are they drawn as, which gender are they drawn as, race, and you know, all these things. Um, you can also choose a significant passage from the book and carry out an annotation activity. And in one of the sources that will accompany this presentation, I sort of explain how you can do that. This is something that I did with uh, the young people I work with, and it was very, um, it was very, I think they enjoyed it, and I think it was very, uh, a good way to have a conversation. Uh, you can also work in groups to do character studies, and that's uh, another thing that I include in the resource kit. Like, I asked, there was a certain set of questions that I asked that you can, I mean, you can take and adapt. And this works really well when you have a novel spoken from different perspectives. And you don't have to just look at adolescent characters, you can look at adult characters. So basically do it in the way that's gonna be useful for you. Uh, these are some other questions to ask. Um, and this looks a bit more at the, you know, the adolescent versus uh, the adults. So linking the stereotypes with the stereotypes that they came up with the first activity, the brainstorming activity. Um, and this is where you can talk about the form does the choice of point of view, what role does it play? Um, do adults and adolescents switch roles? If adolescents are acting as adults, what are the implications of that? Are they punished in the plot, for example? Um, or does it sometimes put them in a sort of spear position to adults? You can, all sorts of questions. And how do you, do they as readers feel to this? because you might be quite surprised by their questions, by their reactions. So for example, in my two books, focalization was in the Cappuccino book, because it has two main characters, each chapter was told from the point of view of that character. In the other one, it's with third person and the author kind of jumped from head to head, even though she focused mostly with the, the main character. There's a lot of focus on interdependence between the parents and the adults, even though in Cappuccino, the, two male adults were oppressive. So that was disruptive. Um, there's a lot of interdependence among kin group, cousins, friends. And that's something that was also picked up by the students themselves. So when they asked, they, were, they definitely were always evaluating the characters and saying what they liked and didn't like about them. And one of the things they always came back to in the two books, they really liked how people stuck together and helped each other out. And they made a comparison between that and how they themselves are as students. You know, how if one of us has a problem, we all have to start to just try and figure it out and find a solution. Um, and with the adults, actually, they were kind of in as much as a mess as the kids, that they were facing similar challenges and they were developing in particular ways as well. And one thing that was interesting in Cappuccino where the mother of Nina, and that's the girl whose uncle had appropriated their wealth. In the beginning, there's, their relationship is quite egalitarian. And then at some point she just sort of gains control of the situation. And then you can, you can see the shift in power where she becomes a bit dominant. And she, like, for example, they decide to leave the country and she's the one who makes that decision. I mean, ultimately her daughters are happy with that decision, but you can, it's quite different from what was happening in the beginning of the book. And here I want to share another thing that the young people, uh, in terms of how the young people responded to these books. Uh, for the, the mystery of the falcon eye, they really empathized and sympathized with Ziad and felt sad for him that he was somebody who was quite you know, ambitious, but that he had to leave school because of his diff difficult circumstances. And they're actually also annoyed with his mother, even though she like, uh, like she was taking care of the house, but at the beginning of the book, she's quite cowed by her circumstances and she's kind of always upset and feeling bad. And then in the course of the novel, she actually becomes quite politically active and they viewed that development very positively. 
So I was doing an activity where we were looking at the development of Ziad. And one of the students was like, we also need to talk about his mother and how she develops. So, um, so I think young people can be invested in ideas of parents having more authority, parents protecting their children, even if it might, on the other hand, mean less independence for them or less responsibilities for them. So I think the nice thing with doing reader response, you never know what the students are gonna say. And that makes them a bit exciting. At the same time, you kind of have to be thinking on your feet all the time, but you probably know that as well from you know, working with students, of course. The third idea when I work with the youth lens, which is looking at growth, because there's almost now a requirement in YA that the main character has to develop in one way. And Roberta tries, she kind of problematizes this. And she says, um, the YA novel is a genre saturated with conceptualizations of growth that imply that growth is inevitable, necessary, sometimes painful, and must lead to adulthood. And usually this growth happens as a result of an identity crisis, something we always associate with uh, teenagers. And I think we need to rethink a bit. So what you can do is you can look at how the protagonist character develops, what they become like, and because the assumption there that they're gonna, they're getting closer to adulthood, they never completely cross over. So that reveals what it means to be a teenager, but also what it means to be a good adult. So you ask, in terms of concrete questions, um, do the teenage protagonists develop and change? In what way? How does this come about? Is there an identity crisis? You might find in some books, but not in others. Um, the assumption that an identity crisis is only something that teenagers go through, even though throughout our life until our very last day on earth, we're always, our identity is constantly being reshaped, but we seem to restrict this to teenagers for some reason. Um, also maturing, becoming more adult. What does this say about being a good adult? Should this change have been inevitable? Was it necessary? What was so wrong about them, about how the protagonists were at the start of the novel? And the interesting thing is when coming back to the two novels, even though their choice was relatively random, but there's actually a, a thread that connects both of them. And that, well, one of the main characters in Cappuccino, the male character, and Ziad, were dealing with issues related to masculinity and they were struggling or trying to figure out, and this is from Inhorn and Constantina, how to be a good man and how to be good at being a man. So in the case of Anas, he was, um, well, his father is, you know, domestically abusing his mother and he was, of course, had very mixed feelings about this. He was afraid of his father and his development in the book is how to stop being afraid, to protect his mother, but also breaking the cycle of male violence. Um, Ziad, it's the other thing because by taking care of his family, he was kind of fulfilling the role expected of the eldest son by being financially responsible. And even though the author only has, I think there's only one section in the book where she shows how he has some mixed feelings about this. But for the most part, he seems to have taken it on with equanimity. So he doesn't need to develop a lot to develop a lot in that uh, in that sense. And then more, there's another issue which is national identity because this whole trip that Ziad does to try and get back into his village, which is in uh, within Israel, and get the get the trousseau and come back, he's doing a very physical journey, and it's about finding gold. So it's a, a typical quest narrative, but more importantly, it's about him reconnecting with his roots. So that's, um, you know, I think that's probably the major trajectory he's going to, through. Lena is another case. And this is a case where an author decides not to sort of wrap up her story very neatly. So she is Lebanese. She also has a French passport. She has an American passport. They were living in France before they were moved. They were forced to move back to Lebanon. And you can see her, and there's specific, um, you know, passages where she's talking about this. But this sort of transaction, transnational identity, it's resolved with a lot of ambivalence. And I think um, that's like when, she, when I talked to the author about the different ways, the different, uh, the two plot lines were resolved. So with Anas, there's kind of a happy resolution. With the case of Lena, they have to leave the country. So there's not a very happy resolution. 
And she was saying, look, because in real life, you know, some things can get resolved, some things can't because of, you know, social reasons. So she decided to leave that there. So that was quite interesting. And then we come up to the final thing that I, the, the final question that I used in order to analyze these novels, which is about power relationships and struggles. And this is based on the work of Roberta Trice. And she says something about YA where even it might not appear at the beginning, but the main conflict that's happening is between the characters and social structures. And they're sort of testing out their power. Sometimes they come on top, sometimes they don't. Uh, they have, there are different ways for them to have agency. It could be limited or uh, they could be successful what they want to do. So this is the question, what are the fluid ways in which the individual negotiates with, his, with her or his social, uh, I'm, I'm missing something, uh, the ways adolescent powers, uh, adolescence power is simultaneously acknowledged and denied, engaged and disengaged. And by institution, we can be talking about the family, the school, political institution, but also social norms. So it might not appear to be an institution, but it is. So what are the main social institutions that young protagonists interact with? These are questions that can be asked for students, but the term social institutions should be explained a bit here. How does this relationship develop? Is there a conflict? Do young people have power? How powerful are they? What are the limits of their power? Are the adults more powerful? Or are they, for example, equally powerless? If the book is set in another time and place, are these power relationships similar or different to what is happening in a book set in the contemporary West? So coming back to the two books, um, with Cappuccino, there's an obvious conflict with patriarchal norms and structure and how they manifest in the law. Um, in the case of the domestic violence subplot, that gets resolved when the mother takes out a protection order against the husband. And the only reason that's possible in Lebanon was because there was a huge campaign at the level of social of, uh, civil society to make, to give women the right to do that. So it's the law that sort of comes to help resolve and they sort of resolve it within the confines of the law. But on the other hand, there's Lena's uh, problem which cannot really be resolved. And one thing we notice about struggling against power, it's the importance of collective action, whether it's at the personal level. So we see how the friends support Anna and Lena and then the NGOs that protect women's rights. They're sort of highlighted here. And that's of course the result of a collective effort. Even though the book doesn't really go into how this law was came into place, which I think would be an interesting story as well. However, other like with the case of Lena who eventually has to leave the country, she has this conflict where she's saying, you know, are we escaping our problems? And in the end, they were like, well, there's nothing we can do to resolve it. And the only hope they have there was like, there are lots of groups who are working to change things. So that's quite a vague hope. It's hope in the future. And there's no sense of for Anas and Lina to say, you know, how about we get involved in those initiatives? There's none of that. In the case of Ziad, it's something else because Ziad is a bit more active. And despite, you know, how, uh, dangerous his, his, his mission is, he does actually accomplish it. He does get back his trousseau, he, villages his, he visits the village of his grandparents, he connects, he finds an excuse to connect with his cousins who are like in the Palestinian diaspora. So there is a youthful agency and it's about uh, also collective action is really important, whether in terms of people supporting each other, but so he's, the reason he's able to go back to his village because there's an NGO there that's working to connect, you know, descendants of the villagers with that village. So, and they help him out a lot. They help him find the trousseau itself. And there's the idea of you resist by exploiting the blind spots, especially in Israeli surveillance and control. So it's kind of like resistance through stealth, which is, you know, interesting. And it's a reflection of the reality, you know, of the context of the book. I'm gonna go through this very, very quickly. Um, I've also included this article in the resource kit and it's about using banned literature to talk about uh, ideas of youth. This is something I would have loved to try but I don't think I would have gotten away with it. If you can get away with it, that's something you can try because the reason certain books for adolescents get banned and this is the argument is because they defy ideas of what's a healthy adolescent uh, development. 
So by, by discussing these books, it sort of reveals what these ideas are. There's lots more details in the, in the article. Finally, um, if you do decide to use translated Arabic YA, what are some things you can expect? Because you know, your students might be asking uh, these questions, so it's good to be ready for them. You're gonna notice that whereas the first person narration is the norm in lots of Western YA, it's not always the case in Arabic novels. Like now you've seen two examples in Cappuccino, it was multiple first person narration. In the other one, it was third person. Most of the time it was inside Ziyad's head, the main character, but was also going you know, to his sister, to his friend, to his mother. The voice is more restrained. How you know how with YA we've come to associate a certain teenage voice. And the voice in Arabic novels is quite different. It's more restrained. Um, I think some of that has to do with restrictions that authors face. But I think it's just also how relationships with families are very different. There's the idea of family and community are, and kin groups are really important, even though, especially in the work of Fatima Sharafuddin, sometimes you do have oppressive adults and she doesn't shy away from that. Um, growing up does not necessarily mean independence. There's a lot of valuing in the books, but also among the readers of interdependence. You're less likely to, to find open conflict with adults than Western YA, but you might find ambivalence. I mean, like I said, it's not saying that you're not gonna find it at all, you're just gonna find less of it. The dynamics are gonna be different. There are less controversial topics that are dealt with, but I mean, even if just from these two books, you'll notice that actually, you know, violence is dealt with, um, politics is dealt with, but it's more indirect. And finally, I'm gonna, these are two activities that you can um, carry out. And the reason for that is to sort of take the students outside the, uh, the, the book itself and to think about what we were discussing earlier, which is the cycles of producing these books and gatekeeping these books and receiving these books. So this is, I love looking at Goodreads and I find the different reviews quite fascinating. So this was a novel, not one of the, those that I covered, although it's by the same author. It's called The Servant. And you'll find uh, like the full information about that in the list of why books translated into English. This is what one Western reader thought of it and her dissatisfaction with certain aspects of it. So just to go through it very quickly, it's this book is set during the Civil War. Why does it not? We, you know, we, we barely know that. We don't get an idea what the conflict is about. And if you actually end up reading this book, it'll be interesting to see if the students agree with that. But I think more importantly, it's why is there an expectation for a book that came out of you know, your context to provide this information, to provide you know, the historical information? Is it right for us to expect more of this than from a Western book? I think that's quite, um, and there's another article that I'm gonna link to, and this is by an Indonesian author. She's not talking about um, why books, but she's talking about adult books and translation. And she asks these questions very intelligently about how sometimes as readers, we're not able to deal with very different values in other societies. Anyway, it's really stop provoking for you to read and maybe discuss with students as well. And another activity that, um, that I've also used when I work with master students, I give them four lists. So the first two lists are YA books and picture books translated from Arabic into English. The other, the, the other lists are books available to start with in English, written in English, also picture books and young adult novels. So I distribute them to the students, you put them in groups and you have them sort of try to look for themes. So are there common themes? Are there gaps? Any observations regarding writers, publishers? So sometimes you get the same publishers who are interested in uh, doing translations more than other publishers, perhaps. You have names that repeat. You can try to figure out the national belonging of the writers. Book art, do they reveal stereotypes or not? What are the possible implications for the representation of Arab people? And finally, is comparing the two, you know, the lists. Are the books that were written with a Western audience in mind to start with different from those that were targeting an Arab audience and then were translated. So I want to, this is the final thing. Um, everything 
you, there, like I said, there's going to be an accompanying list of resources. And I will also be pointing out which activities they relate to. So finally, I want to thank you for your patience. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.